the image. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about responsive, but fundamentally I'd like to know what the hell it is. So I've got a question for everyone here. Who's heard of responsive web design? Dear God. Okay, who's used responsive web design? This is amazing. What the hell are you all doing here? You should be up on stage. Um, okay, last question. Who thinks it's the future and fixed width layouts are dead in the water and we should never be using them again? Oh, gradually, a bit, a bit of attrition here. Okay, so those of you who have heard of it, I'm going to run through a bit of stuff about responsive web design. So I'm going to talk a bit of an intro about it, but what I really want to talk to you about is, for those that haven't really experienced it, is talking about some real world stuff. I've been using it out there for a while in the workforce, and I'm noticing a range of problems that people uncover in their daily life trying to do it. So I want to talk about the planning phase, the content phase, the design phase, and the build phase, and all the little areas where responsive web design can really rock and can be an absolute pain in the ass. So, briefly about it. So, we all know that we're living in this world of mobile now. I mean, it's a, it's a given, you know. There are some sites like uh, Twitter and, and Facebook that are up and over 50% or hovering on 50% use. Do you all look at your stats? Yes? Can someone throw out a figure? What's your mobile use very broadly on your website? Does anyone know roughly 5%, 10%, 15%? 30%? 2%. Oh, 2%. I thought, oh my god, that's pretty hard. I mean, it's worth checking out all the time. We should be out there checking what we're doing. Um, and there's also this massive explosion of devices. Now, two or three years ago, when I was talking to clients, they'd be saying, well, you know, five years ago, it was, oh, on a wiki. You remember that day? And then two or three, or maybe three years ago, I need to go on social media, I need a Facebook page. And then the next phase after that was, I need mobile. And now people are starting to sell, which is great. They're saying, I want responsive web design. So the, the mobile ones are really hard on to address because. There are so many different devices out there in the marketplace. Now, this is not going to be talk on mobile, which would be just a pain in the ass. What I really want to talk about is responsive and where it fits in to this scenario. So, you could say that responsive web design is just basically about creating a page that can grow and shift and change to suit any type of device. So, it can be widescreen or it can collapse gradually and fit an iPad tool or an iPad wire or an iPhone or anything like that. So, instead of building specifically for devices like we used to in the old days, we can now build something that can shift and change and suit any device. Make sense? Now, Ethan McCoke came out with this um, three rules about two years ago. And the three rules he talks about are that it should be a flexible uh, grid, and it should have flexible images, and that it should have media queries. The funny thing is that you can do a responsive web design without anything. Um, in 2004, a guy called Cameron Adams came up with something called resolution dependent layer. Does anyone remember this at all? Okay, well anyway, 2004, you guys were probably still in kindergarten. But for us old people building websites back there, there was this thing called response, uh, resolution-dependent layouts. And you could build a layout that shifted and changed it. And it just didn't use media groups. They weren't invented it. So it used JavaScript. And in those days, we didn't use liquid layouts for that. We used fixed width layouts. But it solved problems for many sites. So we used to build a thousand wide, an eight hundred wide, a six hundred wide, and a narrow one for the screen room, for, um, for my mobile devices. And so there was responsive web design for many years, but it just didn't match some of these things. But the bottom line is these three are great guidelines to follow. So what are the strengths of responsive web design? Well, I think there are basically just two great things about it. The first one is this concept of device agnostic. When you go to these true mobile experience, you've got these problems of trying to dish up to exact devices. Whereas responsive design, one of the things it does really well is it just says, I'm going to shift and change and bug you. You could be wide, you could be small, you could be narrow, and it'll work. Yeah? The second thing is, it's very easy to build. I've just run a workshop today, and 20 minutes, the class has never done it before, and we built a responsive uh, group based lab. It's incredibly easy to build. Very hard to plan, but very easy to build. So, what are its weaknesses? And one of the funny things about responsive web design is a lot of people think it's the total answer. But the bizarre thing about it is, it's purely visual. A true responsive web design only solves the visual aspect. It means we can shrink and grow a page. But it doesn't solve bigger issues like bandwidth. Like if you're trying to put in uh, a very large image, how are you going to change that when it goes down to a small screen? You're still going to bring in the same image. What about movies? Are you going to bring in a very large movie and, and let that be seen by a small screen device? Or are you just going to turn it off? So responsive web design solves some really good things, but it doesn't solve some others. 
The other thing which I think is more hilarious than this is everyone's focusing on the technical, but the reality is our biggest problem is the user experience. A lot of people are talking, I'm sure a lot of you are in the room, as you said, are doing it. Have you nailed the user experience? Do you find it very hard to shift between the different devices and have something that's really smooth and people can use really well, a small screen and medium screen and large screen? It's a very hard thing to nail really well. And of course, it's project management, correct? Right? Then they get this problem, I'm sure you all have. Have you ever sat in front of a client and they said, I want an app, or I want a mobile website? And you think, Jesus, how do I answer this? There's so many problems you've got going on here. How do you address that problem? Well, I'm really, when I'm talking to a client, there's a lot of times when they don't need a mobile website all these days, and a responsive website will answer their needs very quickly. And you can sit there and say, what are you really after? Or you want something that will work on an iPhone, an iPad, and other devices? And you show them a couple of examples and say, that's what we want. But in some cases, you have to explain to them what the fundamental differences are. And a very basic way I can explain it is that websites are fundamentally about tasks. People come to your site for a range of tasks. And there might be a time when a large subset of your audience are coming and hitting your site with a mobile device and they're trying to perform a subset of those tasks. Yeah? And for those cases, it might make perfect sense to deliver it as a mobile website. And a good example might be something like a newspaper. They've got a very large site that does millions of pages and all that sort of thing. However, people might be coming with a mobile device very specifically to get news and weather and latest information. And that makes perfect sense still to build a mobile website. One of the things that I am really, really worried about seeing is that some people are starting to see responsive web design as the answer. And they're just scrapping the other solutions. But there's some really good cases where you should be still doing mobile or still be doing that. So it's not the total answer, but it's part of it. Has anyone heard the term REST? Ah, here we go. <coughs> so, what's the term? Oh, sorry, I'm putting it on the spot. Responsive and server side. So, I was driving along one day, and there's a guy called Ethan, uh, called uh, Luke Dabrowski. He's talking on a podcast, and I've just built this first, you know, it wasn't the first, it was a responsive website. I'm feeling like, yeah, I'm wrong, this is really the answer. But there was this funny, funny thing in the back of my mind, like, it really only solved part of the problem. And I couldn't pick my finger on exactly what the problem was. And I'm driving along, and he's being interviewed, and he comes up with this phrase. And you know what, have you ever had it when you hear someone say something, it actually hits you in the eye. It's like, oh, I think it would hit me so hard, I pull off the side of the road, like, oh my god. Because he said something that had been in the back of my mind for so long. And he said, responsive web design is such an easy choice that people make. It's such a tempting solution because it's so easy for web designers because you don't need to touch the server. Yeah? All it's doing is fixing the pictures and things like that. It is such an easy thing. I'm a front end guy. I embrace it in seconds. It solves a lot of my problems. I'm not a bad guy. <coughs> I'm terrified of service art. So for me, responsive web design is a great thing. But is it a perfect answer? And the reality is, as we move into bigger websites where you're trying to deliver bigger action and, and trying to deliver you know, rich media across, we're going to have to start moving to service side as well. All those things we learned in mobile, we have to bring in, we're going to have to be starting to do it. Now on small little websites, responsive web design is fine. But if you've got a big site with lots of media, there's going to become a time where you're going to use JavaScript and trick browse and load up images in different ways, or get onto the server and doing it. Would you agree? Not even know. You disagree strongly. Okay. Now the one thing I find most interesting is, I don't know whether you guys are reading articles out there about responsive there's millions of them. It's the flavour of the month and it's on everything. And almost everything at the moment is responsive images. Would you agree? Everything's about responsive images. But the thing I find bizarre about it is when you're building real world sites, it's a tiny aspect of the job. Tiny. The actual build of responsive web design is like 5% of the job. These are arbitrary figures, but bottom line is most of your job is planning. Yeah? It's not this little part of the build. And I think a lot of people are so focused on responsive, responsive design as a technique that they're forgetting that it's part of a huge picture. And really, all the stuff about building different layouts and how it's going to work for user experience, they're where all the work goes in, not this little part of technically how you build it. So be aware that it's not as simple as the build. A lot of it is about planning. So I'm going to quickly whip through some of the things that I've uncovered and, and cried about when I've had to be involved in projects and planning. Who's ever heard the term mobile first? Yeah? So a lot of you have heard it all before. Whether it's mobile first or small screen first, I'll give you two examples. Uh, I had one job a while ago, I heard it late last year, 
where it was a very full-on web application for builders out in the field who had to do this sort of information so they had to be able to work in the office and work out in the field. And so it had to be, uh, it was responsive, but it had to work across all different devices. And the experience had to be quite smooth across all those things. And we started with mobile. We started with sketchy, tiny screens. The wireframes were tiny screens. The prototyping was with tiny screens. The design was with tiny screens. And then we went to large screen. And what was amazing about it was that all the problems were addressed at the tiny size. When you start with small, people really have to get to the core. It's a tiny screen. What the hell can you do in that little frame? So you get rid of all the crap and you focus on really what is this app trying to do? What is this function of this web trying to do? When you have to start with small screen, you really get to the core of it. And then when you get bigger, suddenly you relax, you've got more space. Job number two, going right through right now, I've been on the phone with a designer, almost in tears, but she's been in tears, not me. A different project, totally the other way around. So they've done beautiful wireframing, and they think they're doing a great job, and now they've started design, and now they're fixated on large screen. They've spent weeks mocking up large screen. So now we've moved away from the small screen, and everything is focusing on large screen. Buttons are being refined, images are being set, it's all beautiful in widescreen. And then now, the poor designer is now going to try and ram that back into a small screen device. It's a painful job. She's going through hell. If she'd started, and it's not her decision, it was the, the client. If she'd been able to start with small screen, now it's not always the answer, but sometimes you have to work at both ends. But what I'm finding is that if you can start with small screen, it is so much easier to go large than it is to start with large and try and force fit into a small screen. Does that make sense? Here's another thing. Prototype to bugger. Just prototype at every single stage. When I'm starting a website for someone, and in fact this job is just going through now, my very first job is not going to start doing a big deal. I will literally make my own little framework grid for this site, and I'll show them, and I'll sit with them and we'll move it in and out, and show them how, images, how things will drop and move. Very simple little box diagrams, all made out of HTML, and I'll get them to sign off on that very early. We'll see what it looks like very quickly. What's it going to look like in various devices when we move it in and out, the different sizes? Right up front, we want to nail that. And the other thing is we want to be testing how it's working throughout the process. A lot of people go through this sort of thing and they don't test to the very end. Test as often as you can. One of my clients is fantastic. It's the Australian Museum. We just bought a full responsive website. One of the great things we've got is a captive audience. At any stage, you walk up the front end with a device, show it to some users and say, what do you think of this? Give them a play with it. But everyone's got friends and family. You can all test on you know, other people. Don't ever build something and then at the very end, Shove it in a user's face and say, what do you think? Test as early as you can. Another quick point is breakpoints. Do we all know what a breakpoint is? A breakpoint is where you decide the layout's going to change. So you might have a three-column layer, and at a certain point, you decide it's going to drop two columns, or one column, or something like that. But technically now they call it a breakpoint. So when the responsive design first came out, Clients would say religiously, I want to be 1024 breakpoint, and I want a 760 breakpoint, and a 420 breakpoint, and a 360. You know what these are? The different Apple devices. Of course, there's thousands of devices on the market now. We should never, ever be breaking based on devices. We should be breaking based on content. My partner thinks I'm insane. She comes into the, the, the study, and I'm in there late at night, and I'm moving screens in our game. I'm obsessed with watching go in and out. But a lot of my time is trying to work out where is that perfect point to drop that column. And it's got nothing to do with where it sits in a particular device. It's got to do with where that line length is most comfortable. Where does it suddenly become a bit tight? That's where I want to drop it. Make sense? It's not about devices. Remember we said this is device agnostic. We should be banging breakpoints based on the user experience and the content. Not based on some arbitrary device that in three months could have a different screen size. Agree? Disagree? You're all just sitting there. I want some anger. <laughs> um, UX consistency. Another quick one. Who's heard of Smashing Magazine? Hands up. Who thinks of rocks? Yeah? Great website. Who's ever moved that in and out of the browser? Have you seen it and just gone, holy fuck, what's happening? So here's the thing. It's a beautiful thing. But the people who do it were always on crack. <laughs> but what they decided to do was they put up a nav here and then said, what we're going to do, we're going to stuff with their minds. When it moves to this website size, we're going to jump it right over here. And if you're following the name, you go, move the oh, it's going over here. Now, Roger introduced me to this concept quite a few years ago when we were talking about um, people with cognitive impairment. 
A lot of people do this when you're using a website. You just may not be aware of it. But here's how you do it. You're showing your friend something, you go, I, I just click here, and I click down here, and then it's over here. Have you ever seen yourself do that? That's cognitive memory. You on a website know where something is, you've mapped many to it. And what happens if someone takes that button away? Good happens. You go here. What? It's gone. And suddenly there's this feeling of rage. Sometimes you punch the monitor. But there's this feeling that you've been you know, lost in translation. Well, Smashing Magazine breaks that mold very quickly. If you move the, the website uh, screen in slightly, it can radically alter the user experience. So, there is a big difference between widescreen and mobile. However, the transitions, you should not shock the user on the way through. Yes? No? Agree? Again, it's test frequently. We rave about that. Content. Here's a real shock to you. Do you know what the most important thing on a website is? It's not whether it moves in and out and responsive, of course, it's content. A lot of people forget this in the process, but here's the other problem. Most of the clients I speak to have this preconceived idea of what mobile is. Mobile, I'm sure you've got this a lot. Two things. Mobile is people who are time poor and bandwidth poor. Who's heard that before? It's bullshit. We know now most people use their devices on the toilet. It's a fact. Here's the thing. Most people are now using their devices sitting at home on the TV or around the home. They have lots of time and they've got great bandwidth. So this idea that mobile is only for these sort of very fast users, and of course there are those as well, but we can't do this preconceived idea that if it's going to be mobile, if it's going to be small screen, it's going to be tiny content because they've got that time. Yeah? So what we should be doing is start to write wisely, and think wisely about our content. Are there any content creators in here? What? Anyway, there's this whole movement out there called responsive content. And some of the things people are starting to go back to is early days of web. You remember when we wrote, you know, with pyramid writing? That means that people don't have to invest a large amount of time to read a whole page. You can give them a bit of text, and they can decide whether they're going to commit to that information. Instead of reading three quarters of the way through the page and going, well, that was shit, you want them to be able to get that information quickly and go, okay, I'll keep reading. Make sense? There's things like show and hide as well. Obvious stuff that you can possibly try, allowing people to look at a bit of it and then open it up if they want to continue. And the final thing that's really blowing people's mind is everyone is building a responsive web design, including myself. The standard thing is just drop a column, yeah? You have two columns or three columns, you just tuck one below. Is that really the solution? What if you've got sponsors who pay money for their ads and you just say, if I were you, when you get small screen, you're going to the very bottom of my page. And yes, it's three kilometres down there if you scroll, but I don't care about you. Your sponsors may not like that. And there's movements in there called content following where with bits of JavaScript, you can put in empty containers, and instead of dropping, you shunt content across into the middle of other content. Now, is this the answer? I'm not saying it is. What I'm saying is, don't just assume you can drop columns. Start to think wiser. Make sense? Not much money. OK, design. I've just talked about this, but it's the same principle again. A lot of people start well, so they start planning small. But when they get to design, immediately, because it's such a paradigm people understand, they go straight back into designing for the live screen, including the poor designer that I'm working with at the moment. Here's another thing that I find interesting. You spend weeks and weeks designing this beautiful architecture, and the home patient has a visual hierarchy. You've got a main banner, and you might have secondary banners or something like that. And you think, this is really important, because you spend a lot of time getting this hierarchy right. And then when it shrinks down a small screen, bang, suddenly they're all the same size. What? Really, we should be trying to make sure the hierarchy is maintained for anything. If you've spent the effort to make this bigger on the home page, why would it also be worthwhile making it bigger when it's a small screen? Yeah? So you should be really thinking about it and spending a lot of time moving in and out between different sizes and saying, OK, there's my banner. Am I still getting some hierarchy when I'm traveling down to the sizes? Make sense? Another one that's sort of quite interesting, and it's really a freaky thing for people who've got millions of uh, images on their website. But if we're trying to tailor good content to different devices, not only should we possibly be doing smaller images to smaller devices who may have different screen sizes and bandwidth, but should we be doing the same image? A quick example is on a large screen device, you may put an image of a person standing in a room and you have a lot of space around them. But once you get down to a small screen, 
Do you want that person to be a tiny little ant in the middle of the photo? There's a possibility it may be much better crop tighter when you get down to a small screen. Now, these are things we should be thinking about in art direction, etc. Except it's freaky when you're thinking about thousands of images across the site. Now we get to build. Who's ever used uh, or heard of Twitter Bootstrap? Dear God, is that the most rockiest thing on earth? Who likes it? Who hates it? Why do you hate it? Um, Why? The two of you all talk at once. I'm, I'm sick of sites looking the same. Sorry? Uh, I'm sick of sites looking the same. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Why do you hate it? Because it's better. Sorry? It's better. You can do better? No, there is better. I can't hear you. There is better. Oh, there's better? Of course there's better. I hate it for two reasons. One is that I was in the middle of this amazing training that I thought, being you know, wank that I am, was going to rock the world. And then I came out and went, God, I've done things better than I could have done. So there was that. But one thing I've got, it's a dirty little secret for you. Even though I love frameworks, in all the responsive websites I've built, I have never used a, one of these frameworks. Never. And do you know why? Because most of the time I don't design them. Even what I have, they don't seem to fit. What I end up finding is I build my own grids. I roll my own. Has anyone had that problem? So they sound great in theory, but most of the websites I get are designed by someone else. But what's great about them is you can use the same concepts as what these people do. These uh, grids have really abstracted out the layout, and that's a great thing to learn from. So when I'm building websites now, I tr try and bring that same mentality in. Rather than build things in location-based styling, you think about how you can abstract it all down and build your own little grid. That's still fine, but learn from what's out there, and again, you test for is anyone roll the road for everything? Same sort of thing. Okay, here's a couple of quick CSS things which could have wrap up. So one of the things you have to debate, and it's entirely up to you, is that classic thing that you may have four or five style sheets or four or five little areas of a CSS file. And are you going to overlap them or have them all unique? Now a quick example would mean that you have a width of you know, 700 to 600, 600 to 500, 500 to 400. So you've got different styles going on in different areas. Now you can do it two ways. You can have each one a unique chunk that doesn't overlap. Or you can overlap them so that you can uh, you know, write styles more efficiently. There's no right answer here. Because I've found that both can work really well in different places. Sometimes it's more efficient to write once and just write little rules that adapt as you go up. But in other cases I'm finding that I'm overriding so heavily that it's better to keep them contained. And what I'm trying to say here is, there's no rule. Sometimes you have to do it based on the side. Anyone disagree? Agree? Had problems with it? No? Last one on the pain of uh, developing a site. So there's a tiny browser that doesn't support media queries. Uh, and it's probably a hard one to guess, but can anyone guess which browser doesn't support media queries? <coughs> I, I think Bruce is giving away uh, 10 books to site point for anyone who can guess. Is it Internet Explorer? Holy shit! It's Internet Explorer! <laughs> IE6 to 8 does support media queries, or as we all know. But there's two quick solutions. One is just a wrong respond.min.js, tiny little piece of JavaScript which forces IE6 uh, to 8 to go out and media queries. Piece of this, technically speaking. The other way is to use a conditional comment. On some uh, government websites I've done, including the Australian Museum, where at that point they decided they didn't want to use JavaScript as the solution. You can actually just pull one of the style sheets into a conditional comment, take out the MIDI query aspect, and you've got a fixed width style sheet for IE, and all the others get responsive. So it's very quick to be able to deliver a non JavaScript thing that works across as well. So there's always alternative. Oh, we're going to talk in detail about all this. We're running a bit on time. So here's a quick thing Who's seen responsive tables, all these great things where you can shift and move? They're great, aren't they? Have you ever tested them? Have you ever looked at what users? One of the great ones actually changes access. Have you seen that one? Where it starts down, and when you move it, it goes across. Can you imagine a problem with how that could be for some people? So just be aware that while some of them are amazingly cool, they could present problems, challenges for people who are used to looking at a table in a certain way, and you're possibly reverting the whole concept of the table for them. So the good and bad just test frequently often. Now there's just so much discussion out there on, on rich media and how to deal with it now. And what I'd probably suggest, if you're going to look right now, CSS Tricks has got this amazing, uh, pretty well a, um, a canonical discussion about that going on right now, which is which responsive image solution should you use? 
Anyone seen that article? It's just incredible. Go there and you've got a chart of all the responsive options, including PHP server-based ones and JavaScript-based ones and just, you know, standard um, media query-based ones. But there are so many options out there now. And including the thing that you may have to build your own. The Australian Museum site we've, that we've got at the moment has nothing in there at the moment apart from just sort of resizing images. But as soon as I get back into Sydney, we're rolling out a JavaScript-based one for that company. So there are so many options out there available to you. Finally, there's the after. One of the things I'm amazed about is that often people build a site and they just bugger off in the distance. And I used to love doing that as well. But really, we should be building style guides. What we should be doing, if you've gone to the trouble of building this beautiful grid structure and you've got all your buttons and all your little style sheets, then really all those things should be documented so that someone else can come on after you, especially if you've done you know, really good object-oriented CSS, where people could take little things and put them together and rebuild off your styles. Yeah? Of course, all of you build little star cards afterwards so people can follow them. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll just say as a final note is the job is never done. The Australian Museum website went live three weeks ago, that's the latest one I've done, and we used HTML5, but with no HTML5 elements at this point, and it doesn't use any JavaScript. We're testing it for six weeks, and then we're going to roll out second iteration, which will move everything to HTML5 elements with a shim, HTML5 shim. And then we're also going to be putting in respond.js. Then soon after that, we're going to be rolling out a version where all the images will be swapped out and small ones will be pushed into JavaScript, etc. And then we'll probably be looking at REST in a few months after that. So we're rolling out a bunch of sprints. We're getting live and moving through. Really, a website should never be finished. We should always be back in there working out how to build it. So basically, here's some quick points to wrap up. Fundamentally, I'm sure you all agree that. In six months, four months' time, none of us will be building a fixed with layout again. Can you really see a time when you can honestly look a client in the face and say, yep, I can build it a thousand pixels wide, and that's it? It's just not going to happen. Six months, four months from now, you'll be doing it on every website. I do it even when a client doesn't want me to. I just say, look, we're going to build it this way. Because I don't want to be going back there three months later and having to put back in something. So it's going to be the base. Whether you do REST on top of it or mobile on top of it or apps on top of it, regardless of any of that, it's not saying it should replace these, it should be the base for everything we build. And in some cases, that's all you need. In some cases, you need more. But as point two says, you may still need REST or mobile or something else. The second thing I want to stress, or number three actually, is the build is only part of the process. I see so many people focusing on the build, you know, how we build the site responsibly. And really so much of it comes down to planning and wireframing and prototyping and making sure the site rocks at all these different sizes, that the build is just a tiny aspect of that. If it's possible, if possible, now it's not always possible, sometimes you have to retroactively fit a fixed width slide into a responsive site, but if it's possible, I found a great way to work with mobile first. It means you're freer as we talked about before. And the other thing, as we said, test, test, test. Test with friends, test with family, test at wireframes, test at prototypes, test as you build it, test as you design it, test at every single stage. I cannot believe that people aren't testing enough. It's really the backbone of everything. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, although I have to say that when we're talking about content, we're not talking about the fine details of a specific page. We're talking about content chunks. You know, you've got uh, paragraphs of text. Generally, we're saying that we want them to be fit within that comfortable reading zone. You know, like uh, the two alphabets is maximum you want to go wide. So it's not saying on every particular page you're tweaking. It's more just you're making sure that these main chunks of content aren't squashed together too tightly or that the line length is too broad. We're trying to make sure they're comfortable. I thought you were going to ask something which is hard, which is what if you've got a CMS and you can't get access to make it responsive, which is a much bigger question. I'm sure half the people in the room have to address, and I have no answer to that, except get a new CMS, because that's really practical. Um, what kinds of wireframing and prototyping? Sorry? What kinds of tools do you use for wireframing and prototyping? 
Well, I'm very old school, so I'll often do very rough stuff on paper and do very quick stuff like that, and then I'll just build an HTML. Just very simple. Like, there's a lot of tools out there. That the one thing I don't like about a lot of those wireframe and prototyping tools is they use uh, analogies. They use a lot of sort of fake things. And what I've found is that uh, when I've shown them to people, they're not only, you're actually expecting them to, to understand two levels of abstraction. You're asking them to understand the abstraction of a, a fake wireframe and that it's a fake website. So when I try and do it, I try and make it a real website just with fake content in there. So that they're not having to understand two levels of abstraction as well. Does that make sense? So I've seen a lot of those great tools, but you have to sit down with people and explain that it's a wireframe or a prototype, and then that's the purpose of a website. So I just find it easier to build something straight. Yep? How effective is that resizing a browser window as a way to tell when you're going to get on a phone. That's something that you sound like you're doing. Start, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm slightly dead, so you have to well, speak up. Yeah, resizing the browser window. Yep. Is that an effective way of seeing what you're going to get on a mobile phone? It's not the answer, but it's a great starting point. You know, one thing I do love about it, especially using Opera, which can go right into a tiny size. Can you notice that Chrome won't go in past a certain point? Turn of a browser it is. It's a great way to start because, you know, one thing I love about it, it stops you thinking about iPad, iPhone, you know, that sort of thing. But it's definitely not the answer. Really, what you should be doing is gathering a bunch of old crap devices that people are throwing away across the spectrum and getting a little talking. Who's heard of uh, ClearLeft, the UK based things? There's a, a guy at ClearLeft called, uh, yeah, 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 for what he's saying, uh, Jeremy Pink, putting more posts out at the moment. He did a call out to everyone in the community around this area in Brighton and asked them all to bring in their mobile phones. You should be doing that here. Get someone centrally located in the area. All of you chuck in your old mobile devices, shove them out on a desk, and get a test kit. And everyone from the area can just pop in, test it, and they'll go get bootstrap, and they'll get all these things, and they'll bang a site together. And as the gentleman up the back said, they were all the same. But that's not the point. You can't override them. But they're bringing in all these components because that's the way it's done. But it's like doing a battleship. Sometimes you need a, I was going to swear, a little tugboat. You don't need a battleship. So there are times when it's better to simplify. And the question you asked is, I've never had to use um, the, the, the modernizer. It's just something I haven't had to do. And I, I, I slightly worry that people dump these components in and the assumption it could be useful when it may not ever be needed. So I generally try and wait until I need it. So on a real world site, I've done a lot of testing with it, but on a real world site, I've never actually used it. So what do you do? Like it back out from the site, from the government site, where you know, said no JavaScript, and then you allow the JavaScript, and how do you generally do it? Um, I've just you know. used very simple JavaScript, like a shim and then you know, respond.js. So I try and keep things simple. I mean, I'm a simple guy. I've only got a tiny bit of an IQ, so any of those sort of things would be on my capacity. And give me my own front end guy, so I'm doing the fail anyway. What are your thoughts on CSS? Preprocessors like less than SAS doing? Ah, totally, totally different discussion. Okay. I'm not a friend of SAS, and as I just said, I'm a front end guy. With SAS, you have to go to terminal. Now, I'm actually allergic to the terminal. <laughs> Touch it, I break out in pipes. I love less, but I love the compiler less. I think, I don't think this, this is insane, but you can actually run less live on the server using JavaScript to compile. Does anyone think that's the most insane thing on earth? What you can actually do is turn off JavaScript and, oh, I keep going to swear, every single style in your site will disappear. But uh, less has this great compiler. Is that what you use? I love it. It's a compiler, so you can write... Uh, who's, who, does, who has no idea what we're talking about? Okay, so... Where are we going to go? One minute. One minute, okay. <laughs> what these are is preprocessors. So let's just take a quick example. You have ten colors. You have a huge website, you've got ten colors. And every time you come to the site, this little area, you've got to reference the color. And you're like sick of it. You're writing an href, you know, like an uh, 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 hex color, and you've got to remember it. There's a chance you may misspell it, yeah? What less of the sounds of these things I need to do is to reference them at the top of the document, say, here's color 1 to 10, and then down your document, you just go color 1. The advantage is up at the top, you can then change color 1, and it's done right through the document. That's just a tiny example. Another one would be um, uh, linear gradients. To do a good linear gradient, you should do WebKit, uh, MOS, MS, O, and then the real one. Every time you bring in a linear gradient, now on the site you can have 15 or 20 of them, you can write that as a variable once at the top. 
And then when you bring it down below, just change the colours. And that will rewrite them all for you. Uh, there's a lot of other things I'm doing there. But basically, fundamentally what they'll do is they'll just allow you to use variables. Who has been wanting to use variables in CSS? I mean, I'm a front end guy, and even I can see the need for variables in CSS. Okay, I think we're out. We've got to run. We literally have to jump in a cab and go to a plane. So, huge thank you. Sorry we're so rushed. Um, but I hope it's worthwhile. See you.